NACDL is the Association of the Nation's Criminal Defense Bar. I will tell you something, um, and that is I have the honor of, uh, of giving this award um, to Governor Deal. And uh, I said to Governor Deal, uh, you know, not, I, I don't know Governor Deal other than being a fan of Governor Deal. But I could say this, um, I was really fortunate to be invited to the Aspen Institute to speak. And uh, not only was I kind of a rock star because I came from the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, who I realize the whole country now loves because criminal justice reform is vogue. But everybody would say to me, oh, man, you must know Governor Deal. I'm like, man. Um, and, and, and Governor Deal, the country loves you. The country loves you. And, and, <laughs> and the country loves you because the word has spread that when you go and you give degrees at accountability courts or Jason, your, your son's program in Hall County, or you go to the prisons, people have seen you with tears in your eyes and they could see the love coming from you. And, and you know, this world right now of craziness, we're a little short of love. And the nation realizes that you are just not a politician, but you're someone that speaks from the heart. So I'm so honored to be able to do this today. And, and so, a little bit about um, our governor, the state of Georgia. He's the 82nd governor in the state, in, in, in our state. And, and my research tells me that you were raised on a farm and, and the son of public school teachers. I'm going to talk about this in a second, the importance of education when it comes to Governor Deal. He is, is, is a veteran of the United States Army, where he was a captain. He, he <laughs> um, he, and, and what really distinguishes him, he was just not a superior court judge, but your roots were that of a juvenile court judge. And then he went on to Supreme Court. He was a state senator, he was a congressman, and ultimately a governor. And as a governor in the state of Georgia, and also the, the father of, of one of our great superior court judges, uh, Jason Deal, um, your son believes in accountability courts. Uh, trust me, I've been in front of him. And I've been in front of him with some folks that have had drug issues. And, and Jason Deal, your son, cares about treatment. He cares about you getting to the other side. So it's not, it's not unusual that when you became our governor, you put at the forefront criminal justice reform. And, and I want to say one thing that I whispered over to, to the governor, and, and that is that um, uh, Solicitor General of Hall County, Stephanie Woodard, who's a buddy of mine, um, was on your criminal justice commission. And so we're going to try to get through this, Stephanie, without getting teary-eyed. But you all should know, those who are criminal defense lawyers, um, that there's a family in Hall County. And they are the Summer family. And the Summer family is a family of criminal defense lawyers. Dan Summer, who we name in Georgia, we name our Indigent Defense Award, statewide Indigent Defense Award in his honor. His wife, Shondell. Now his son is a Fulton County public defender where Shondell and I started with Vernon Pitts. And now another son is working in their firm, criminal defense attorneys. And that family of criminal defense attorneys has always said that they love Governor Deal and that Governor Deal is somebody that cares about our issues. And so it was not a surprise to me. It was not a surprise to me when you became governor that you focused on parole and probation changes you modify those changes. And under your leadership, prison population has dropped dramatically for the first time since 2002. 20% <clears throat> of African Americans' prison time, excuse me, 20% of African American prison population has gone down during your tenure as governor. You have created accountability courts, 105 accountability courts. 4,000 people, because of you, have gone into treatment instead of going to jail. You have taken the position, and, and I've read article, national article, about the fact that you've taken the position, and maybe it's because you're the child of, of, of public school teachers, and maybe it's because you're in juvenile court, you've taken the position 
that you have to fight crime before it becomes crime. You have to fight crime by going to the schools. You have, you have focused on education. And, and you have taken the position that, that let's, let's attack the issue when you're born, not when you're finishing up the sentence. And, and that is created you as a trendsetter in the United States of America. You have revamped our juvenile justice code. You have taken the position that treating 12 and 13 year olds should not be punitive. Yes. And you have, you have revamped our misdemeanor courts by, by a, addressing the issue of probation fees and fines and making those a way that should not shackle people to courts just because of a simple misdemeanor case. That money should not be what keeps you from freedom. Because of you, crime in Georgia has dropped 24%. You have proven, you have proven that mass incarceration is not the way you stop crime. And it, in 2017, we have seen the lowest number of folks sentenced to prison in Georgia in two decades under your leadership. Governor Deal, I want you to know when I ask that we do this program um, on collateral consequences and prisoner reentry, um, as the president of the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, I wanted to do the program in Atlanta for many reasons. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to be Atlanta and I wanted to be in the state of Georgia because when it comes to this issue, there is not a political leader in the nation that leads it more than Governor Nathan Deal, who is the recipient of our Champion of Justice Restoration of Rights Award. Right. Well, thank you so very much. Thanks to all of you for being here in our state of Georgia. Uh, I am deeply honored by this recognition, and I truly appreciate it. I think I got all of my crying done over there, but I cannot guarantee it. This is a subject that is close to my heart, and one I think is of great importance to our country. To those of you who are from out of our state of Georgia, welcome to the great state of Georgia. Uh, we are doing what we think are many great things for the citizens of our state. Uh, we brag about the fact that for five consecutive years, we have been named the best place in the country in which to do business. And we're working for that sixth year that's gonna hopefully come around very soon. We also, though, are being recognized, as you have heard, as being the state that is one of the real leaders in terms of meaningful criminal justice reform. I put emphasis on the word meaningful. Sometimes many things become politically popular, but are dealt with only at the surface level. And usually at the surface level, really important issues do not get resolved that way. I want to give you a brief overview, and I appreciate the information that has just been shared about our statistics. I'll touch on a few of those as I go through. I'll try not to bore you as we go through. One of the first things, though, that I need to tell you is that I have learned, and fortunately, I learned it before I became governor, and that is this. If you're going to make large changes of direction in governmental activities and in society in general. You better be a patient person. You better approach it incrementally. To ask society to swallow big issues all at one time generally does not produce the kind of results that you want. In January of 2011, when I was sworn in as the governor of this state for my first four-year term, one of the topics that I broached in that first State of the State address was the need for criminal justice reform. Now, it was not a popular issue. It was not really being talked about by many, very many people at that time. And I got asked afterwards, well, Governor, why are you doing that? You're a Republican governor, and that doesn't sound like a Republican issue. Why are you doing it? Sometimes simple answers are the best. I simply said, because it's the right thing to do.
<laughs> and if you're trying to do the right thing, you'll be surprised how many times your adversaries simply sort of fade away. Now, what we did is initially, because I did understand that you have to do these things incrementally, I appointed a criminal justice reform council. It was made up of people in the criminal justice arena who were familiar with what we already had and with hopefully visions of what we could be. They took that first year, and then in the second year of my term, they came back with recommendations that we presented to our General Assembly. They too decided to take an incremental approach, and it has proven to be correct. The first year, we focused on the fact that with a prison population that was the fourth largest in the country, when at the time we were only the tenth largest population state, did not make a whole lot of practical sense. I jokingly told crowds, I just don't believe Georgians are that much meaner than everybody else. They generally agreed with that. But we had a system that did not reconcile with that, with that feeling. So we took an incremental approach. We decided, well, let's look at those individuals who by our own definitions were classified as nonviolent. Now when you start breaking it down and apply common sense to some things, people begin to look at things that they have never looked at before. They just simply gloss over them. The throw away, men, the lock them up, throw away the key mentality. It was prevailing in our state as it prevailed in many parts of the country and in some states, states still prevails. I said, okay, now tell me, why is it that you think that people that we classify as nonviolent, you're paying $19,000 a year per person to lock them up in a prison system. Well, not many common sense people that would think that's the right thing to do, but we were doing it. A large percentage of our prison population was classified as nonviolent. I'll tell you the good news on the flip side of that coin is the percentage of those in our prison system now that are classified as nonviolent are at least 10% lower than they were in 2011. And the converse of the side of that coin is the percentage of those who are in our prison systems are classified as violent. That's what prisons are for. Those who are violent, those who pose a risk to the rest of us in society. So we started at that front end with the nonviolent offenders. We had a few accountability courts, a few drug courts, DUI courts, and now what we have seen is that they have proliferated in our state. Not only those two types of accountability courts, but veterans courts. We have a large veterans population since we have many military installations in our state and people tend to retire back in the communities around those military installations. And now we have variations of mental health courts, family courts, the recognition that it is a larger scope of people that are involved in true reform than just the offender. There are those around them. There are those that are involved in this process. So that first year, even though it was deemed to be controversial, when I first made the announcement in 2011, when the General Assembly convened in 2012, we came with an expansion of accountability courts, including those that I have enumerated. And guess what? It passed the General Assembly of Georgia unanimously. Not a single dissenting vote in the House or the Senate. The second year, we decided to attack another portion of the, prime, of the crime problem, and that was juvenile crime. Now, if we think $19,000 was an expenditure that you can't justify for nonviolent adults, try $91,000 per juvenile. And we were having a recidivism rate in our juvenile community of about 65%. So we decided if the model works for adults, let's try it 
as it applies to the juvenile population, namely community-based alternative programs that divert them away from our juvenile justice system and our incarceration. I know you're not supposed to use that word in the context of juveniles. I know better having been a juvenile court judge. Our detention type facilities um, and it has also worked. It also passed our General Assembly unanimously. So what's the lesson to be learned from those first two years? The lesson to be learned is if you educate the public with real facts and you explain to them why things are important to break their mindset that we've never done it that way before, you can be successful. I jokingly say you can't generally get an adjournment resolution passed unanimously in our General Assembly. <laughs> but those two passed unanimously. We then moved through the system. We started at the front end of nonviolent adults, moved to the juvenile arena, and then we began to move into those who are already convicted and incarcerated in our system, in our prison system. At that time, as was mentioned, we had a prison population that was somewhere, was projected to be, by the end of my first term, it was projected to be at least 60,000. We were also projected to see that growth pattern over my second term, and I'm only four months away from the end of my second term. And it was projected to be even greater than 60,000 by that point in time. The truth is our prison population is around 52,000. We did not have to build the two new adult prisons at $264 million cost uh, factor that I was told I was going to have to do during that first four years. We haven't done that. We've in fact been able to convert some facilities to transition centers, et cetera. So that proved to be very successful. Now, in, as, you, as I approached the issue of those who are already in the system, I wanted to know one simple thing. What is the most common characteristic of those in Georgia's prison system? So we did a survey. Not surprising to most of you, I'm sure. It came back that the most common characteristic was that they did not have a high school diploma. They dropped out of school. In fact, it was almost seven out of every 10. Now, if you don't have a high school diploma in today's society, it's simply a foundational starting point for getting a job. So if you tackle the issue of those who are in the prison system and your ultimate goal being to make sure that when they are paroled, that they don't come back. In other words, if you're concentrating on recidivism rates, then you need to find out what is it going to take for those individuals, once they are paroled, to be successful so that they don't come back. If 70% of them don't have a high school education, that's a pretty good starting point. That's a fundamental starting point. We have seen our education within our prison system grow so rapidly I can't even give you the percentage. It is through the roof. We, like most prison systems, concentrated on GEDs for a long time, but we finally realized that if you can give someone a little higher credential from high school, such as a real high school diploma, it does make a little better impression on prospective employers. So we contracted with a charter school to come into our prison system and give people the opportunity to make up for what they didn't get when they were in high school and get a real high school diploma. <laughs> and that has been very, very successful. And it is ongoing. It's something you can't give up on because until such time as people stop coming into our system without a basic education, then you're going to always have to address that issue within the prison system. So, as we are seeing our prison population drop by about, uh, well, actually it's dropped about 8,000 below what it was projected to be back in 2011. At the same time our prison population has dropped down, our state's population has increased. 
In fact, it has increased so much that if it stays as it is, Georgia will pick up one additional congressional seat in the United States House of Representatives. We've grown that much. We're no longer the 10th largest state. We're now the 8th largest population state. Now that's what everybody would like to see. You'd like to see your present population drop as your general population grows because normally the two move simultaneously in the same direction. We're fortunate that we've been able to begin to break that cycle. Now, I want to share with you some statistics that give meaning to what I just said. If you're truly interested in being able to change the dynamic of criminal justice and, and have meaningful criminal justice reform, several things I think you can take away from Georgia's statistics, and that is this. It was alluded to earlier, but our overall prison population commitments have dropped almost 20% between 2009 and 2017. But like most states, especially states in the South, we had a very uh, disproportionate number of African Americans incarcerated in our prisons compared to our general population. We have seen the commitments of black males drop by 29.7% during that same time frame. That's almost 30% decline in roughly eight years. During that same time period with regard to African American females, the number is even better. A decline of 38.2% that are now a part of our prison populations. So overall, as was indicated, uh, our commitments of African Americans to our, to our state prison system is at the lowest level it has been since 1987. And Georgia's grown a lot since 1987. <laughs> there are all sorts of benefits derived from prison cr criminal justice reform. When I was campaigning for governor during the year 2010, and uh, I want to recognize uh, Levitt Bennett that you recognize as well, he is one of my newest Superior Court appointees, and I know he's going to do a great job, but he can tell you that just like every judge that I have interviewed, prospective judges I've interviewed, I ask them where they stand on accountability courts because that's a, a, an emphasis point for me, and uh, I know he's going to stand us in good stead in his circuit. But what is happening is when I was on the campaign trail, you know, we all want to go talk to the sheriffs of the county. They're some of the most powerful political figures when it comes to local politics. So I'd go talk to the local sheriffs. Almost invariably, I could predict what they were going to say. When are you going to get these state prisoners out of our local jail? Now, we were paying them a fee on a daily basis to house our state prisoners, but we were still paying too much in terms of we didn't have any space in our prison system to pick them up and put them. So we had to ask local jails to hold them a little longer. In 2011, when I took office, the sum that the state of Georgia was paying to local sheriff's departments to hold state prisoners was $25 million. Last year, it was zero. And why is that? It's because we had taken those nonviolent people and, not, and stopped putting them in the prison system. We'd given them an alternative to a second chance for their life. And that made financially, from that standpoint, made all the difference. And then if you add the costs that were associated with diminished incarceration costs, not having to build more prisons and not having to hire more people to work in prisons as the population within the prisons dropped. Uh, it is a rather astounding number, and I haven't asked anybody to calculate all of that for me. But I'm simply saying that it works. Accountability courts are one of the best things we have had. Now, 
As I said, sometimes you have to do things incrementally. Sometimes you have to uh, resort to means that you would hope you would not have to do just to get people to do the right thing. But many judges, many district attorneys in our state did not like the idea that they may have to assume responsibility for a drug court or a mental health court for all of those kind of things. Because see, it's easier to sit on the bench behind the robe and send somebody to prison than it is to be a drug court judge, such as was alluded to, my son is a drug court judge in our Northeastern Judicial Circuit. And to have a drug court where you have those who are enrolled in the program who report to you on at least a weekly basis, and you have to supervise those who are supervising them during the rest of the week. So some of them just decided, well, I'm not going to do that. And they sat tight. We bumped up the supplement that if you will do a, an accountability court in your circuit, uh, we'll pay you, I think it's now $6,000 more per year if you have one. You don't even have to be the judge who presides over it. It's just that you have one in your circuit. I'm pleased to say that we have every judicial circuit in the state of Georgia now that has at least one type of accountability court. And I'm thinking that it's going to grow rather exponentially. As And I've had the opportunity, I'm told by people who keep numbers and watch these things, that I've had the opportunity to appoint more judges than any other governor in the history of the state of Georgia. And I can assure you, I'm making sure they understand that this is an important policy issue. It is an important moving forward issue for our state. So we're, we're appointing people who are judges and district attorneys. Now, I don't get the chance to do that for everybody because we do elect our judges and we elect our district attorneys. But oftentimes, vacancies occur during the course of uh, a term of office, and I get the opportunity to fill that vacancy. We're seeing more and more acceptance as we get younger judges, as we get those who have been more involved in the system and see the difficulties that are encountered there, they are becoming much more receptive. So I am very, very pleased with that part. Now, there's another. If we want to talk money, and sometimes that's what it takes to, talk, to get some people's attention, is talking money. I've talked to you about the cost savings of not having to build new prisons, of not having to hire more prison guards, of not having to pay all the other incarceration expenses associated with it. But our accountability courts, by our latest uh, estimate, has been that for those who go through an accountability court and graduate, that their economic impact to Georgia on an annual basis is about $38.7 million because they're working. They're not sitting in a prison cell. They're able to support their children rather than having the children become dependent on the state and the federal government. That is not an insignificant number in terms of what it does, both psychologically to an individual who feels like that they are a member of society because they're working again. Now, yes, they're being supervised, and they're being held accountable. Yes, they're subject to random drug screens. And yes, if they don't do what they're supposed to do, they're liable to wind up in the local jail for however long the, co the drug court judge determines is appropriate to get their attention. And for some people, many of you know, it takes a while to get some people's attention. They think they're going to be able to do what they were always doing and not have to suffer the consequences. Now, one of the phenomena, and I'm talking too long, and I know that, and I apologize to you, but sometimes I think stories, uh, true stories, illustrate a point. Um, my wife and I, we live up in uh, the northeastern part of the state of Georgia. We live in a relatively rural area, and my wife is not sophisticated in terms of the kind of things that some people think governors and first ladies should be. Uh, we don't shop at fancy places. We don't eat in fancy restaurants. I don't like the food, quite frankly. You know, I can only take so much frou-frou, and I need some good old Georgia country cooking. But sometimes, and it's happened many times, 
It has happened so many times. <laughs> it's becoming commonplace. And that is, a wife will be shopping somewhere in a clothing store, for example. And uh, a young woman will come up and um, be working in that store. Now, I'll tell you, some of them, they've got their arms loaded down with tattoos. Some of them still have some pierced ears and noses and lips and all those kind of things that I still don't totally understand. <laughs> and they would come up to us and they say, I, w I have either been in your son's drug court or I've graduated from your dr son's drug court. <laughs> My goodness. You're saying that in public <laughs> where you can be heard by anybody? You're making that admission so everybody can, can hear you? I'm having a normal reaction in that regard. I finally began to see it through their eyes because they would rapidly say, it saved my life. And that different point of view that I finally understood was they weren't ashamed of that fact. They were proud of it. And for many of them, for the first time in their adult lives, they had something they could be proud of. And that's very important to anybody. And that's what those accountability courts do. By the way, if you're interested in keeping people from returning to the system, our latest survey indicates that for those who graduate from our accountability courts, the recidivism rate is 2%. Wow. That is phenomenal. <laughs> now, before I get into these statistics, and I'll try to be as brief as possible, I want you to understand that my point of view is that education reform is the greatest form of criminal justice reform by all stretches of the imagination. And we continue to pursue those educational reforms in our state because the lack of an education, just as that 70% with no high school diploma in prison now demonstrates, if you have no basic education and you're a male, your likelihood of winding up in prison is greatly enhanced. If you're a female, your likelihood of being dependent on welfare for the rest of your life is greatly enhanced. So, it benefits and behooves us all to insist on a better education system that keeps these people from making the bad mistakes that require all of these treatment facilities and prison beds. If we can avoid that on the front end, I can assure you it is a whole lot less expensive than it is to do it in the middle or on the tail end. But we have people in prison. So what are you going to do with them? Well, we're going to try to give them a GED. We're going to try to give them a high school diploma if our uh, <laughs> charter school is in, their, is in their prison system. And we have found that our recidivism rate for having just that basic high school education diminishes our recidivism rate by 19%. But it gets better. If you do what we are doing on top of that, and that is to give them technical blue collar skills, welding, truck driving, all of the skill sets that are needed and in a state like ours that is growing so rapidly, those positions are available and not enough people to fill them. If you give them technical skills, our recidivism rate for those with that training has decreased by 24%. So we're on the right track. And I think hopefully if you think that's important to your state, I hope you would take that into, into account. But there are also things that we can do uh, beyond that. We decided that sometimes it's very difficult to convince legislators to mandate that the private enterprise system do certain things. Very difficult. We decided we would try to set the example for the private system by what the state did. And it 
it comes down to a simple thing, banning the box. And by that, what we mean is, if you're filling out an application for a job, and usually got a lot of questions, but invariably one of them is, have you ever been convicted of a felony? And if you're honest and that's true, you have to check the box. In past times, those kind of applications with that box checked probably did not get past the human resources officer for that company. So we decided, let the state of Georgia set the example on that. We decided that we would ban the box for anyone who was applying for a state job and that they would be guaranteed the opportunity to have a face-to-face -face meeting with someone in the Department of State Government that they were asking for a job with them to explain what they have done, what they have done to remediate themselves, and why they believe they're qualified for that job. Now, we are seeing some in the private industry begin to replicate that model. Quite honestly, a good economy sort of encourages them to do that because they're shorter workers and they can't really afford to turn their heads the other way. We have also addressed some of the issues that are practical impediments to successful reentry. One of those is, if you don't have anything to prove who you are or have a driver's license, you have a hard time, first of all, obviously, getting a way to go around and be interviewed, and in rural areas that's very difficult to do if you don't have a car or have access to a vehicle. We have issued over 11,000 driver's licenses and personal identification cards so that when they go to rent an apartment or apply for a job, they have a document from the state of Georgia that identifies who they are, that they're who they say they are. It has helped tremendously in terms of employment. But for those who take advantage of those technical skills in our in our prison system being taught by our technical college teachers, we give them a certificate that they can take to a prospective employer that is signed by a representative of the state of Georgia certifying that they have passed the necessary skill test in whatever particular area they have. That has helped tremendously getting them past that initial interview stage so that they can actually get a job. So. For those of you who are in the private sector, I'll tell you as I have told Dr. Ben Carson, the, the uh, Secretary of HUD, and as I had the opportunity to tell President Trump last week when he invited me to come to, uh, to a conference of several governors to talk about criminal justice reform. Housing is one of the real impediments to successful reentry. There are two primary things. One is housing and one is a job. And if you don't address both of those, your recidivism rate is going to continue to be uh, excessively high. We've tried to do that at every turn. To be able to convince, and I suggested Dr. Carson, and I hope some of you will pick up on this as a solution and tell your regional administrator, as I have told the Southeastern Administrator of HUD, who is beginning to come around, I might say. I knew what his answers were going to be to my questions. My first, first question was, well, Dr. Carson, why don't we have any slots in public housing units allocated for returning citizens? I knew what the answer was going to be. You know what it is, too. Well, he said, you know, these are independent housing authorities that have their own boards and they make their own rules. But I was prepared for that. And I said, yes, doctor, but almost all of their funding flows through your office. So I want you to be messengers of that same thing. Now, just between me and you, I think some of, the, some of those who are returning from our prison system that have been educated, who've been given a skill so they can get a good job and make a living, they are probably better risk for that housing authority than some of the people who've never been in that posture but are in their housing units. So I don't think we're asking them to do something that is unreasonable. Y'all pick up that as a cause, okay? Because if they don't have a good place to live, 
if they have to return back to the same setting in which they got in trouble in the first place, what is the likely that they're going to recidivate? Very, very high. And I heard one of your speakers say basically that just a few minutes ago. So concentrate on getting the private sector involved in offering jobs. Now we have one that set a great example in the private sector in Georgia, and that is the Bluebird Bus Company. They are the largest maker of school buses, I think, in the United States. They have been so desperate for good welders that they told us several years ago, if you will train inmates who have welding skills sufficient for us, we will hire them. And they have, and they continue to be willing to do so. So, if we give them the skill set, if we give them all of the tools that they need to convince an employer that they will be a good employer, and what we've done is gone one step further. This is where it gets to be hard to sell sometimes. We have given the prospective employer limited liability protection against aggressive plaintiff lawyers who want to sue them because they hired a previous felon, that they can't be just simply sued and held liable just because they hired a previous felon, if it has nothing whatsoever to do with the very basis on which any claim they may be asserting is actually based. So we're doing it. We're having to do it incrementally. I suggest that if you're doing it, uh, and many of you, your states are doing it. I, I heard from several other governors, and I was flattered when they would all say, well, we're following the, mo the model that Georgia has set. That didn't make too much impression on uh, Rick Perry, the former governor of Texas, who claims he was the first one that did it. <laughs> but that's okay, it didn't matter. Uh, the, the president put him in his place in the first, first few minutes we were there. He, he went around the table introducing all of us, and one of them was Rick Perry as uh, Secretary of Energy. And he said, now y'all know this is Rick Perry, the former governor of, Flor of uh, Texas, said, you know, he, t he was in the, the race to be president when I was. And he called me a cancer. And uh, I went home, my wife said, did he call you a cancer? I said, yes, he did tell, he called me that. And he said, well, he dropped out of the race and pretty soon he said I was the salvation of the Republican Party. He <laughs> said, I went from being a cancer to the salvation of the Republican Party. He said that all with him sitting about closer than you and I are right now. And it really got to him. It sort of humbled his Texas uh, superiority complex. <laughs> But he soon made up for it because the president said, well, how are we doing on energy? And he said, well, we're doing real good, Mr. President. And I learned something, too. We are now a net exporter of energy in the world, unlike what we have been in the past. And uh, we had the governor of North Dakota who is un undertaking criminal justice reform. They're way behind us, but they're looking at our examples and learning from us, which is a good thing. And Perry said, well, you know, we have the governor of North Dakota here, and he's the second largest energy producing state in the country. Second only to Texas, of course. Oh, my goodness, give me a break. But anyway, um, people are taking notice of what works. And I believe we have great examples of what works. Now, there are many other topics. I have been asked uh, several times, what do you foresee? as the next steps in criminal justice reform. Well, there are many other things that need to be done. I think we have laid a great foundation for that. Um, we have just this past session dealt with uh, the ability for those who are unable to make cash bonds or any kind of bond on misdemeanors, nonviolent misdemeanors, to give the judges greater discretion to release them on their own recognizance makes no sense to keep somebody in a jail cell for something that you wouldn't have sentenced them to much time for anyway just because they can't pay the bail that has been set for them. We're making progress on that spot. Um, we are also uh, making progress in a number of other areas and uh, I think we are beginning to break that prison to pipeline, pipeline from, uh, from school to prison which is a pipeline that is desperately in need of repairs. But we also did something else, and I'll try to close with this one. I think that's the main thing I need to tell you. Um, we found out you can spend a lot of money unnecessarily 
within the criminal justice system. The best example was that sometimes a person will get a rather long sentence imposed by the sentencing judge. Probation will come along through our pardon and parole system and grant them a parole far before the long sentence that includes probation on the tail end before it runs out or even kicks in in some cases. So what was happening was, since they were paroled and had to be supervised by a parole officer, but since they were also on probation from the original sentence, they had to have a probation officer. And if you were involved with a juvenile in that household, it was not uncommon, I'm told, that they would go to one household, they'd have a, a, a car from the juvenile justice system in the front yard, they'd have somebody from the pardon and paroles board there in the front yard, and then they'd have a probation officer pulling up as well. Well, we said that makes no sense. That is a duplication of effort, serves no useful purpose. Other governors had tried it for years, and they'd never been successful in combining parole and probation supervision. We were able to do that several years ago. We have a, a, a department now of community supervision combining those two functions, and I must say, not only is it saving money, it is working much more efficiently. So I want to thank you in conclusion for being interested in this subject. There are many other avenues that need to be explored. I think even though we have taken hard looks at mandatory minimum sentences and have made reforms in that regard in some areas, there are certainly more areas that need to be explored in that regard. Um, I think that uh, as we begin to see success, success breeds even greater success. But you also have to demonstrate it that it's not just talk. You know, a lot of folks just talk, but they don't back it up with anything. Sandra and I have been privileged now to live in the governor's mansion for now almost eight years. All but just about three people that work there are inmates in our state prison system. They are brought to the mansion every day from a local transition center right here in Atlanta. And in the afternoons, or in some cases, late at night, like I had a banquet last night, and they stayed and served and cleaned up the dishes and all of that, so they were late getting back to the transition center. But they are inmates. And we take a personal interest in trying to make sure that when they are paroled, that they have that opportunity for a place to live, for a place to get a job. And the success stories that come out of that are truly heartwarming. And I have established and my wife has established friendships in that prison population that is now free and on their own that we will have for the rest of our lives. In fact, the chef at the Georgia Governor's Mansion came to the Governor's Mansion as an inmate. He became an assistant to the hired chef that the state had had. She'd been there for about 30 something years. When she decided to move on to another position, I told him, I think you're qualified to do it. So he is now the head chef at the governor's mansion. He got married at the governor's mansion about a month ago. I had a great ceremony there. And he is pursuing a culinary arts degree at one of our technical colleges and will soon achieve that. Success stories <laughs> like that Hold it cause everybody to cry. It's good news. It's the kind of things that we all want to have. And the more of those kind of success stories that we can show to the public, the faster and more effectively we will break down the barriers of the past. Thank you for the honor you've given me here today.